by the outbreak of the Second World War, India's long struggle for freedom from Britain's imperial rule is becoming more and more likely. Years of oppression and exploitation may soon be over, and a new but daunting future beckons. It will also signal the end of Britain's mighty empire, the greatest the world has ever seen. For both countries, the future is uncertain and worrying. For Britain, it will mean coming to terms with national decline and the responsibilities of the inheritance of empire. For India, it will mean independence, the fulfillment of Mahatma Gandhi's dream and that of every Indian. Using recently discovered and rare archive film, much of it in original color, this is a unique visual illustration of India's journey to independence. India, a visual homage. Southwest India, 1938. Deepak Chandrasekhar attended a missionary school near Calicut in Kerala before settling in England after the Second World War. He recalls a childhood full of fond memories. As children, we had very little, of course, at least by modern standards. But my father served in the Indian Army, so we were luckier than most. Life was simple, much as it always been. But the sun shone every day. We had the sea and the rivers and the food was plentiful. Not like other parts of the country. There they had droughts and famine and thousands died. During the war, there was a huge famine in Bengal when food supplies from Burma were cut off by the Japanese occupation. It was terrible. Nobody knows how many died. But it was more than a million. I remember our traditional dancing, especially the pretty girls. Most of our teachers were Indian and the school had Hindu, Muslim and Christian children. And most of the time, we played happily together. Padmasini Amal, a member of the Sisters Association of the Indian National Congress. The British are a strange mix. Some are well-meaning paternalists who see us as children in need of their help. They don't realize how condescending they are being with their little pats on our heads and the odd kind gesture. Others are not unkind, but they think we are inferior and treat us accordingly. A few are simply intolerable brutes who treat us like dogs. They are to be avoided at all costs. We wait on them, we bow to them, we do their washing and attend their every whim. I'm tired of it. We're all tired of it, but few dare say anything. The worst part is the sheer indifference. We are just one great mass of ignorant, unwashed humanity to them. They either look straight through us or just turn away in disgust. They impose taxes on everything. What are these taxes? Are they to suck out our lifeblood? They plunder us for our money and make us living corpses. Look into a railway garage. There is breathing space for a gunny sack, but not for a man. It was in a train like this that my friend Mapilas 
died of suffocation. His Excellency, the Most Honorable, the Marquis of Linlithgow, has been Viceroy of India since 1936. The tall, gaunt Etonian and former soldier who fought on the Western Front in the Great War, he is a strict Scottish Presbyterian and not popular with his Indian subjects. India's leading civil servant, V.P. Menon, has few kind words for him. His seven and a half year regime, longer than that of any other viceroy, was conspicuous by its lack of positive achievement. When he left India, famine stalked portions of the countryside. There was economic distress due to the rising cost of living and the shortage of essential commodities. Linlithgow rules India like a monarch. Unlike the king and emperor at home in Britain, he travels across India in his own royal train. Here, he's inspecting the civic guard in Bombay on the eve of war. When Britain declares war on Germany in September 1939, Linlithgow commits his Indian subjects to Britain's cause, but in typically arrogant fashion, without discussing it with the leadership of the Congress party, which speaks for the vast majority of the Indian population. Not surprisingly, the Congress leaders are offended by the unilateral inclusion of India in the war and resign from office. They begin a long debate among themselves about how to respond to the Viceroy's affront. Mahatma Gandhi issues an appeal to the world. This war has descended upon mankind as a curse and a warning. It is a curse in as much as it is brutalizing man on a scale hitherto unknown. All distinctions between combatants and non-combatants have been abolished. No one and nothing is to be spared. No cause, however just, can warrant the indiscriminate slaughter that is going on minute by minute. The war creates an agonizing moral dilemma for the Indian National Congress Party, as it does for India's other political parties. Former Congress leader Subhas Chandra Bose leads a breakaway group and organizes the Indian National Army. He visits Hitler and, with the help of the Japanese, will conduct a guerrilla war against the British. Congress meets and, after several impassioned speeches, a new strategy emerges, which rejects support for the British war effort and becomes known as Quit India. Gandhi calls for a mass protest demanding an orderly British withdrawal from India. Almost the entire Congress leadership is imprisoned without trial, at least 60,000 people. Most will spend the rest of the war in prison and out of contact with the masses. After its ruthless suppression of Congress, Britain's war effort continues undaunted. It still has the support of the Viceroy's Council, the Muslim League, the Communist Party, Almost all the princely states, the imperial and state police, the Indian army, and the Indian civil service. It is a powerful alignment of India's elites. November 1941, a meeting of the leadership of the Hindu Mahasabha, led by its president, the poet and intellectual, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. Although he is a Hindu nationalist and opposes the secularism of the Indian National Congress, Savarkar believes in the unity of India for Muslims and Hindus, and indeed, for the whole world. Throughout this world, there is but a single race, 
the human race, kept alive by one common blood, the human blood. Truly speaking, all that one can claim is that one has the blood of all mankind in one's veins. The fundamental unity of man from pole to pole is true, all else only relatively so. December 1941. Mohammed Ali Jinnah chairs a meeting of the Working Committee of the Muslim League. He is an astute and determined man. Born in Karachi and trained as a lawyer in London, he and the League are totally committed to a separate state for India's Muslims. It is extremely difficult to appreciate why our Hindu friends fail to understand the real nature of Islam and Hinduism. They are not religions in the strict sense of the word, but are in fact different and distinct social orders. And it is a dream that the Hindus and Muslims can ever evolve a common nationality. And this misconception of one Indian nation has troubles and will lead India to destruction. The Hindus and Muslims belong to two different religious philosophies and social customs. They neither intermarry nor dine together, and indeed they belong to two different civilizations, which are based mainly on conflicting ideas and conceptions. They have different epics, different heroes, and different episodes. To yoke together two such nations under a single state, one as a numerical minority, and the other as a majority must lead to growing discontent and final destruction of any fabric that may be so built for the government of such a state. Jinnah is prepared to support Britain's war effort, but at a price, which is, of course, a land of the pure for the subcontinent's Muslims, Pakistan. the northwest frontier of India, late December 1941. The Indian army is digging in. The Second World War is getting closer and closer to the gates of India. The Japanese army has conquered vast swathes of territory in its war with India's neighbor, China. German warships are in the Indian Ocean. The Imperial Japanese Pacific Fleet is about to set sail for the attack on Pearl Harbor. The German invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, has made dramatic progress. Kharkov, Sevastopol and Rostov-on-Don have fallen and the German panzers have reached the outskirts of Moscow and Leningrad. If the Red Army is beaten and the Soviet Union falls, India will be isolated on all sides. The Indian Air Force is training new recruits not only for the defense of India, but also to fight in Europe for the mother country's Royal Air Force. It is deployed against the Japanese in Burma, where its first strike is on the Japanese Air Force base at Arakan, and then later against Mai Hon Song, Chiang Mai, and Chiang Rai in northern Thailand. Twenty-four Indian pilots will fly sorties over Britain and Europe. Eight of whom will not return. Wing Commander VSC Bonaji is one of the first batch of recruits. 
I enjoyed the life, the training and the food. Being a Christian, I enjoyed the bacon and eggs, cold chicken and ham rolls, sausages, beef steak, etc. Oh, so British. But food which, to many of my brother officers' trainees, was taboo. British and American sailors arrive at the Royal Naval Dockyards in Bombay for some shore leave. Their ships are part of the patrols that are trying to protect the transport vessels taking Commonwealth troops to Europe and the Mediterranean. The convoys are under constant attack by the Japanese, German and Italian navies. The dockyards are a hive of intense military activity. Troops are arriving by train from barracks all over India. These Indian troops are part of a Commonwealth contingent traveling to the Mediterranean, where they will fight with British, Australian and New Zealand comrades. First and third battalions, first Punjab regiment, and first battalion, 9th Gurkha rifles, are part of the 4th Indian Division. They are to join General Bernard Montgomery's 8th Army in his battles with German General Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps in North Africa. Everything is prepared for desert warfare. There are even command and medical train carriages designed for a mobile war. The 4th Indian Division will fight in North Africa, Syria, Palestine, Cyprus, and then in Italy. Together with the 8th and 10th Divisions, it will participate in the taking of Monte Cassino, after which it will move to Greece. Four men of the fourth will win Victoria Crosses. Over 36,000 Indian members of the armed forces will be killed or go missing in action, and over 60,000 will be wounded during the war. In total, Indian personnel will receive 4,000 awards for gallantry and 31 VCs. Prime Minister of the Punjab, Sir Sikanda Hayat Khan, arrives in the ancient Punjabi city of Jalandhar to address a large crowd as part of the recruitment drive for the Indian Army. An ally of Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the Muslim League, he also believes in Britain's war effort and campaigns for support. The intense recruitment drive continues in every corner of India. In 1939, the Indian Army numbered less than 200,000 men. By the end of the war, it will become the largest volunteer army in history, rising to 2.5 million men in August 1945. Most of the army is commanded by British officers, but there are opportunities for Indian men, as increasing numbers are promoted as King's commissioned officers, some of whom reach high rank. India's war effort is led by General Archibald Wavell, Commander-in-Chief, India. An intelligent career soldier with a passion for poetry and deeply religious, he faces a difficult mission in trying to contain a marauding Japanese army to the east. Burma will fall in 1942 as British, Indian and Chinese troops withdraw to Imphal. While within India, he will have to deal with increasing disruption and violence from the Quit India campaign. 
he will have the support of the Chamber of Princes and its Chancellor, the formidable Digvijay Sinji Ranjit Sinji, the Jam Sahib or Maharaja of Nuanagar. However, the Chamber of Princes is increasingly out of touch with the mounting mood of opposition in the country. Winter, 1941, Wadha Station, Nagpur. Recently freed leaders of the Congress Party arrive to meet with Gandhi, whose ashram, his spiritual hermitage, is only five miles away at Sevagram. True to his lifelong convictions, Gandhi still believes that independence is imminent and that India will remain united as a single country. We cannot evoke the true spirit of sacrifice and valor so long as we are not free. I know the British government will not be able to withhold freedom from us when we have made enough self-sacrifice. We must therefore purge ourselves of hatred. In the democracy which I have envisaged, a democracy established by non-violence, there will be equal freedom for all. Everybody will be his own master. It is to join a struggle for such democracy that I invite you today. Once you realize this, you will forget the differences between the Hindus and the Muslims. I beg you, you must think of yourselves as Indians only, engaged in the common struggle for independence. Jawaharlal Nehru reiterates the call for freedom for the newsreel cameras. The fundamental problem of India is one of tremendous and appalling poverty. That cannot be solved without changing the political and economic structure of India. That is why we want independence and a democratic state and to rid India of imperialism. Those who condemn fascism must realize that imperialism is of the same genus and both must go if the world is to have peace, freedom and collective security. Opposition to the war grows. Nevertheless, Indian infantry troops are deployed in the fight against the Japanese in Burma. It will be a long and bloody campaign. During it, they will face a highly disciplined Japanese army, supported by many of their own countrymen, who will choose to fight with the Japanese as part of the Azad Hind, the anti-British Indian National Army, formed by Subhas Chandra Bose and Mohan Singh. June 1942. The war is not going well for Britain and her allies. Britain is isolated and the United States has still not recovered from the catastrophe of Pearl Harbor. In North Africa, Tobruk falls to Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps. In the most humiliating defeats in Singapore, 35,000 British and Commonwealth troops surrender, including men of the 2nd Battalion, 7th Gurkha Rifles, and the 2nd Battalion, 5th Maratha Light Infantry. They face a long incarceration as prisoners of war. The German, Italian and Japanese navies continue to dominate the war in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, cutting off British India from the mother country. In the Caucasus, German panzers continue their relentless drive eastwards, seemingly unstoppable in their conquest of territory.
their blitzkrieg attacks and ruthless suppression of civilians is total war on a new and horrifying scale. The men of the Soviet Red Army pay a heavy price. But their sacrifice is beginning to turn the war. They are bleeding Germany dry. By the autumn of 1944, the Second World War has swung in the Allies' favor. American, British and Commonwealth troops have landed in Normandy. Despite resolute German resistance and ferocious fighting, by October, they have reached the German border at Metz. At the same time, the Soviet Red Army reaches the Niemen River in Prussia. The Yugoslav partisans liberate Belgrade and free Greek troops land in Piraeus. They are soon welcomed in Athens as returning heroes. Like many countries in the West, it is a new beginning for Greece. But in the Pacific, the war goes on. The huge land and sea battle of Leyte Gulf begins. Preceded by an enormous artillery barrage, the amphibious landing begins the liberation of the Philippines. It is the greatest naval battle in history. 900 ships and 2,000 planes are committed to the fray. Japan's navy is all but destroyed. With heavy losses on both sides, the United States secures its Philippines beachhead. US General Douglas MacArthur wades ashore at Leyte on October 20th, 1944. He fulfills his promise to the Philippines people that he would return. February 20th, 1945. In India, the war is far from over. Men of the third Queen Alexandra's own Gurkha rifles are in final training for their deployment to Burma, where they will join the battle to push the Japanese out of the country. Captain Harbinder Singh, a platoon commander in the regiment's 2nd Battalion. Our training has been excellent and the boys are ready to go. The Japanese are not frightened by too many things in battle. But they're terrified of us when we've got our kukuris between our teeth. The assault on Burma's capital, Rangoon, begins on May 1st, 1945. It is led by a parachute drop by men of the 2nd and 3rd Gurkha and the 152nd Indian Parachute Battalions. They are the elite of the Indian Army's shock troops. Their objective is to take Elephant Point at the mouth of the Rangoon River. The drop begins at dawn. The assault is called Operation Dracula. With the estuary secure, the 26th Indian Infantry Division makes an amphibious assault the next day in atrocious conditions. India's 36th Brigade makes the final push to Rangoon 
in landing craft. The approach via Elephant Point meets only sporadic Japanese resistance from snipers and from men in well-fortified bunkers. As they travel up the Rangoon River, they are met by an eerie quiet. When they reach the city, they find that the Japanese general, Hiatoro Kimura, has ordered Rangoon to be abandoned to the relief of its beleaguered citizens. Those left behind have had to face an orgy of looting and violence. Needless to say, the Commonwealth troops are greeted with great enthusiasm by the locals. Mount Popper, central Burma, April 1945. The Japanese army is in retreat as British and Commonwealth troops advance. The Commonwealth troops are looking for groups of the Indian National Army who have been fighting with the Japanese. Suddenly, a lone soldier offers himself for surrender. He helps locate his comrades. They soon give themselves up in large numbers. The INA on Mount Popper are led by Colonel Prem Kumar Segal, who will later face trial in India on the charge of treason. He will be sentenced to deportation, but because of widespread protests, the sentence will not be carried out and he will be released. 11,000 other INA detainees will also be released and many will resume service with the Indian Army. The Battle of Tarakan, Borneo, May 1945. United States and Australian forces launch an amphibious assault on the island. After days of heavy fighting, the Allies move inland. As they do so, they liberate a group of Indian prisoners of war, men of 2nd Battalion, 15th Punjab Regiment. They are remnants of the garrison which tried to defend Borneo against the Japanese invasion three years earlier. They are in a pitiful state. But their morale and discipline are exemplary. They are just 150 survivors of a battalion a thousand strong. Potsdam, Germany, late July 1945. The victorious Big Three Allied leaders meet to agree the boundaries of the new world order at the end of the war. Although Soviet leader Joseph Stalin is still there, American leader President Roosevelt is dead, replaced by Harry Truman, and Britain's wartime hero and bulwark of the empire, Winston Churchill, has been defeated in a general election. Britain's new prime minister, Clement Attlee, will grant India independence. The Badshahi Mosque, Lahore, 1946. Over a hundred thousand of India's 85 million Muslims are at prayer. Like their countrymen, the Hindus, and people of India's many other faiths, 
They wait expectantly for the freedom they have dreamed of for decades. Pandit Nehru. The ambition of the greatest men of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. That may be beyond us, but so long as there are tears and suffering, so long our work will not be over. And so we have to work hard to give reality to our dreams. Those dreams are for India, but they are also for the world. For all the nations and peoples, we are too closely knitted together today for any nation to imagine that it can live apart. Peace has been said to be indivisible. So is freedom. So is prosperity. And so also is disaster in this world that can no longer be split into isolated fragments. The prospect of imminent independence is met with eager anticipation by the Indian population. But there are also grave anxieties. Sakanda Khan, a civil servant in Lahore. The thought of independence at last is making everyone very excited. Many people thought it would never happen. The British have been here for so long. But there are also doubts. No one says very much, but beneath the surface, there is tension. India has so many problems. Will we be able to cope? There are so many of us with so many different answers. Then there is religion. I have many Hindu friends, but we're terrified of one another. And what will happen when the British leave? Old scores will be settled for sure. And who knows what that will lead to. Simla, Northern India, June 1945. Field Marshal Wavell, who has been made Viceroy, has called India's leaders together in one final attempt to bring the country to independence as a united nation. Gandhi still hopes to persuade Muhammad Ali Jinnah to agree that the new India will be a land for both Muslims and Hindus. But the talks do not go well. Jinnah writes to Gandhi. Dear Mr. Gandhi, to achieve the freedom and independence of our peoples, it is essential to accept the division of India as Pakistan and Hindustan. Gandhi responds. Dear Mr. Jinnah, last evening's talk has left a bad taste in the mouth. Our talks seem to run in parallel lines and never touch one another. The chasm between the two leaders is too wide and the partition of India becomes an inevitability. Sikanda Khan. It is our worst nightmare. It's not so much that it tears the country apart. We just have to accept that that is now a certainty. Millions will have to move in both directions. And what will happen when they meet in the middle? I dread to think. September 12, 1945, Singapore. After the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in early August, Japan has surrendered. The Second World War is over and the people of Singapore celebrate and applaud the Indian troops who liberate them from a brutal occupation. Lord Louis Mountbatten, Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia Command, takes the salute. He will soon play a crucial role in the future of India. By 1946, unrest is escalating across India. There are riots in all the major cities. In February, men of the Royal Indian Navy mutiny in Bombay. The mutiny spreads to other ports, 
until more than 20,000 sailors are involved, and the British have to quell the mutiny by force of arms. In August, on what is called a day of action, but becomes better known as the Great Calcutta Killings, 4,000 people are killed within 72 hours in an orgy of intercommunal murder, leaving 100,000 people homeless. Troops are deployed in Bombay, where hundreds more are killed and thousands injured. Damage to property from arson and looting is widespread, with most Muslim merchants and shopkeepers forced to flee. The local authorities put thousands of troops on the ground, but the threat of civil war increases as firearms get into the hands of the demonstrators. Amita Gupta witnesses the Bombay riots. My father was killed in Mumbai in the August riots. He was an innocent bystander on the way to the bank. The mob suddenly turned on him, robbed him and then kicked him and beat him to death. He never stood a chance. We're living on a volcano. Soon it will explode and many more will die. Gandhi is heartbroken by the violence. He makes several attempts to intervene, all to no avail. His long cherished dream of a liberated, unified and peaceful India is over. The festival of Puri, Orissa, 1946. Amidst the turmoil, India's ancient traditions continue. A hundred thousand people celebrate as the chariot of Lord Jagannath is pulled in ceremonial procession. Lord Jagannath lends his name to the word juggernaut, which means a terrible force that destroys. With independence looming, many people fear that India is facing a fearsome juggernaut of its own making. The talking continues between India's leaders and the British government, but with few concrete decisions. Amidst the turmoil, only two things seem certain, that independence is inevitable and that the Raj, the jewel in the crown, will be split asunder as two separate nations. All the while, as the talks drag on, the mayhem grows worse and the anguish of the people continues. <laughs> 